Well, good morning. Welcome to the program. This is Tom Curran, and I have the delight of welcoming a wonderful guest, and that guest is Sister Mary Eucharista. She is a sister of Mary, Mother of the Church, a community located here in Spokane, Washington. And I want to say welcome back, Sister Mary. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Tom. It's such a delight, and I really, really enjoy talking to you. Yeah, well, and I'm excited because a lot of folks listening, um, they're gonna they're gonna be truly blessed to hear what you have to share today. We're gonna talk in a wide ranging set of topics, but really the theme is growth in the spiritual life. How do we grow in the spiritual life? Uh, you and I were uh, texting or emailing back and forth, and I was saying. Sister, I'd love to have you come back on again. And um, and you would say, oh, I just came out of spiritual direction, uh, which is part of your mission there at uh, at the retreat center and in, in your own sense of uh, mission uh, and apostolate. And it got me thinking, I'm like, you know, how often do people ask me about recommended books for growing in prayer, growing in discernment, growing in the spiritual life? And I thought, I bet Sister Mary Eucharista has some wonderful things to say about that. And then we're going to just flow from there to other ways of growing in the spiritual life connected to the work that you do at the Immaculate Heart Retreat Center. So lots of great stuff to cover today on the program. I'm excited to get started. Me too. (laughs) All right. So welcome uh, to the program, Sister Mary Eucharista. It's great to have you here. Uh, Sister, for those who are not familiar with you, um, give us a, just a, a just a quick overview of your own story uh, of being a sister. Oh, my goodness. Well, that might take a little more time than you really want to invest here. <laughs> but uh, the short side is uh, just I grew up in a very traditional Catholic family. Uh, my mother was Irish Catholic. My father was Polish Catholic. So we did not get away without having a very solid spiritual life. Uh, somewhat coercive, perhaps, in the sense of you are not growing up in this family and not being Catholic. So <laughs> um, we didn't have much choice there. But, you know, we didn't want to have uh, any choices outside of being Catholic because they also loved us into the knowledge that we want to go to heaven and the way to do that is to follow the commandments, go to mass, have the, yeah. attend the sacraments and make sure that we are always uh, staying in the state of grace. So uh, in uh, down in California, we had every two weeks go, line up for confession. Um, there was no question. You just did it. And that's what we did. So, you know, sister, you remind me of my growing up. So mine oh. was... <laughs> Italian and Irish, and oh. uh, my dad was a convert, so even better, right? Let's lay that on. And and here's the interesting thing is that on the one hand, their gift was not talking to me about having an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. They did have a very good sense of letting it be clear to me that how I lived matters and what was in the balance was heaven and hell. Yeah. And um, and that um, that uh, impacted how they parented us. I had a very strong or sensitized conscience about right and wrong. And and okay, yeah. So maybe you talked about coercive. Maybe there was a sense of limitations around that. But I I want to say it protected me from a lot of darkness and evil because I had that strong sense of. I do not want to dishonor my parents and I do not want to go to hell. So can you relate to any of that? Totally. And I don't regret really. I I mean, I did at one point that, you know, there weren't more choices, but you know, I think that uh, if we, if we continue to follow through with what our parents wanted and uh, like I discovered on my own, that intimate uh, connection with Jesus, when I was 11 years old, I, we were, uh, we were making a spiritual communion at home. Now, isn't that amazing that in a Catholic family, we would be doing morning prayers before we went to school. And I was 11. And I remember being bored during this the morning prayers. But when we came to spiritual communion, I was like trying to make it interesting. And I was kind of like, you know, trying to just mom, mom is making this. It's a little formulated prayer. My Jesus really present in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Since I cannot now receive you under the sacramental veil, I beseech you with a heart full of love and longing to come spiritually into my soul and abide with me forever. Thou in me and I in thee in time and in eternity. And, you know, listening to the words of that prayer as an adult, 
I'm really struck by this. And I've even done spiritual direction for uh, Episcopalian deacons in formation. And they took that into their churches with them and uh, shared it with people, especially during COVID when I was like, wow, you know, I mean, because, you know, the, the Eucharist is something so central to our faith. But, you know, I, I wanted them to at least be able to receive Jesus spiritually. So um, I, uh, in that moment when I was 11, I was thinking of Jesus and I thought, wow, I'm not going to receive Jesus today physically, but I'm receiving him right now spiritually. Huh. By golly, Jesus is in me right now. Hi, Jesus. And I'm like, oh, Jesus is in me. Oh my gosh. And so then mom made the sign of the cross. We were finished, but I was like, if I felt this deep abiding, like powerful presence of Jesus in that moment, what would a real communion be like uh, for me to, to engage with Jesus? And I thought, what's wrong with me? Why did I just now wake up? And it kind of occurred to me that in the old days, you know, oh, I mean, and I don't, this isn't something I would ever recommend, but it's like in the old days, remember when the, the, the age for receiving communion was more like 10, 11, 12. At 11, I woke up in my own mind, but I knew who Jesus was when I was six, when I received Jesus for the first time in Holy Communion, because I was a year ahead of myself in school. And so I, uh, by, boy, those sisters were after me to learn that catechism. But um, I did know that was Jesus. And I, I said hello to him. But it was something so powerful when I was 11. And that kind of, I think, started for me an intimate, deeper spiritual living because of my parents' attention to those limitations, if you will, that you mentioned. And that um, concern and uh, dedication, really, it wasn't easy for them. And that was from the Holy Spirit, Tom. This isn't something that our parents uh, loved to just torture our, their kids <laughs> or, you know, they wanted them to go to heaven. Yes. But they also were being inspired by the Holy spirit to, because of their own baptisms, they were being, uh, you know, urged by the Holy spirit to open for their children, a newer reality than just physical life. And every single one of us got it. And that is, I think something that, you can never, even in all the, the millennia that we're going to be in eternity praising God, we're going to look back and say, thank you so much for my parents. Thank you so much for what you gave to me in those formative years that I could never have gotten for myself and never maybe even recovered for myself in a world that really doesn't believe on its own. Wow. Sister Mary Christie, you, you just said some really profound things there. Uh, I was ready to ask you more questions about uh, receiving communion. And then you shifted back to being grateful in all eternity for your parents. I'm like, well, you just, you just opening up all these vistas in front of us here in this interview. So <laughs> uh, let's start with the first one before we fly off into eternity uh, with uh, gratitude, praising God next to our parents with, with our great hope. Right. Let's go back to the, re, re, the spiritual communion, which I love that. And you've inspired me now. You've just upped the game here. I'm like, Carrie, I got to bring this to my wife and say, Carrie, we don't do that with our kids in the morning, but we should, and we can, and that's not that complicated and it doesn't take that long and boy, it can have a profound impact. And you're a great testimony uh, to that. Um, you have a religious name that I've never heard before. You are the first and only Sister Mary Eucharista that I've ever heard. So folks that are hearing that name, how does a, a religious sister end up with a name like that? And then why is it or how is it? Do, do you, is there a story behind how you are uh, identified as Sister Mary Eucharista? Well, I like to joke with people and it's not really a joke. It's a reality, but they laugh and it's, I'll say it, it's my husband's name. So, you know, I mean, I <laughs> and I show him my wedding ring and it's got the Holy Spirit on it and I'm married to Jesus and I'm Mrs. Eucharista. I remember telling uh, a cardinal about this one time and uh, he, he said, uh, he said, Eucharista, that's a beautiful name. Wow, that's a beautiful name. You are you are blessed to have such a name. I said, it's my hubby's name. And he said, oh, you're hubby. I said, yes, the guy I'm married to. And I pointed to my ring and he said, uh, he said, well, 
sister, I prefer to say spouse. And I said, well, it's my hubby. And, and he said, you're right. You're right. So uh, I do really recognize my marriage with Jesus Christ. And I am grateful that God has given me this ability to do something. We've talked about spiritual communion, but I'm talking here about the marriage of the soul with the Lord, which is all of our eschatological journey. It's what we're all going to be doing in each other. You just used life. a big Lord. Yeah, a big word there, sister. Eschatological. Come on, Eucharista, <laughs> eschatological. But you referred to Jesus as your hubby and yes. the spiritual espousal. I think that, again, that's something that there are folks that are watching or listening and they're like, oh, I know what she's talking about. But what do you mean when you talk about the consecrated life as an act of spiritual espousal to Jesus Christ? Well, that's the whole, I mean, without the marriage to Jesus, the consecrated life would be a kind of a sterile endeavor. It's uh, Jesus by offering us the church, offering us the uh, the communal living with uh, bound by vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience under a rule or constitution. Um, this is our opportunity to take these three vows, chastity, which, uh, which is in contrast or the healing for the moral wound of lust in our lives, the um, concupiscence of the flesh, um, chastity. So this is chastity, poverty, which is the balm or healing for the moral wound of the concupiscence of the eyes, which is everything I see, I want. It's a materialistic thing. So and by that vow of chastity, by the way, going back to chastity, we remove from ourselves any kind of longing for any one or attachment to any person in this world outside of the Lord so that we can. And of course, you know, it's it's where, where we have to always stay focused and directed and let him love us. And in that knowledge of our marriage with Jesus, we have a husband who we will never find fault with him. And if anything goes wrong in this marriage, you know who did it. <laughs> it's not <laughs> Jesus. It's me. So uh, that's where uh, at our daily examination of conscience, we always can say, well, yes, in my marriage today, how did I offend against my marriage? Well, I, you know, and I, and how did my marriage increase in, in grace and my union with Jesus? And that's a daily question that I think everyone can ask, but especially with the vow of chastity, with the vow of poverty in the removal of our material things, it's like, we don't, it's not that we don't use material things. So we don't, you know, uh, we don't keep our own money. The money comes from the community and uh, anything that we need, we have to check with a superior and you're, we're put in charge of certain things, but then we, in, in, in the, our needs and all, we need to be able to know that I am keeping this vow in a, a, a modicum of, of things that are needed for our daily duty, for our life to be lived. Um, so we use them not for the things themselves, but for the work that we're doing or the, the, the way that we're being able to operate as religious sisters. And the vow of obedience uh, is that balm or healing or area of um, concern where we, uh, the pride of life, which I consider to be the hardest of my vows. It's the one that, um, you know, I think I have a great idea. I go talk to this period about it. She explains, yes, that is a great idea. And I don't think we'll be using that idea at this time. And it's like, what? Oh, come on, really? Come on, maybe. And then it's like, wait, 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 wait. What's this vow? Does this vow demand a lot of me? Yes, it does. But you know, you usually don't use it every day, like in your superior telling you to do something. It would be more in uh, a rhythm of life that we live, in the way that we operate as um, a, a group, and also in our relationships with each other. So that's where that vow of obedience is especially um, a, a guard against that um, pride of life that comes to us that is just part of our natural uh, effect of original sin that came down to us. And as I grow older, these effects of original sin really are starting to, to exemplify themselves. I think as wisdom continues to 
uh, come into our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, the uh, consistent reception of the sacraments, the living of the spiritual life in the best way that we know how, um, and receiving direction, receiving uh, the, the gifts that God is always offering to us, and in increasing in faith, hope, and charity, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, and all those other virtues that link onto them. That's where the wisdom of seeing uh, everything that the church teaches, it's kind of begins to be laid out in front of me, and I'm just noticing, wow, I love age. I love to grow old in the Lord, because this is where wisdom, which I prayed for ever since I was in sixth grade and I read the story of Solomon, I was like, I want wisdom, Lord, give me wisdom. And so many other people that I've told this to said, me too, I prayed for that in sixth grade too. And they're all the wisest people that I know. Uh, but I just realized that this, this uh, beautiful vowed life that Jesus has given to us. It's we have a family in the community. We have a spouse in Jesus. We have spiritual children all over the world. Everyone we've ever met is in our prayer now. Um, all the, uh, it, Jesus says, when St. Peter said, uh, what we've given everything for the kingdom of God, what then shall we have? And Jesus said, for all of those of us, all of those of you who have done this, you will have a hundredfold in this life, uh, along with brothers, sisters, families, lands, blah, 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 keep it going, and life everlasting. And it's true, Tom, it's true. So how did I get my name, Eucharista? Well, I got my name because- By the way, sister, that was the uh, longest windup I've ever had. You just actually gave this incredible spiritual conference to me and to all of our <laughs> wonderful listeners and viewers. I, I'm like, I've got like five more questions now. Oh, uh, great. Just, I want to keep, keep exploring the treasures that you're kind of pouring out to us. I'm sincere. This is oh, yeah. it's beautiful. I'm kind of taking it in and I'm just like pondering it all as you're talking today. I love it. So- I'm um, with Sister Mary Eucharista, right? <laughs> and she is now going to answer the question, which is, how did she get her religious name, the name of her profession, Sister Mary Eucharista? Well, uh, we were told as postulants to put down three name possibilities, and uh, I had 17 other young women in my group, so I put down three names. I look back and I think those are the most awful names I could have ever put down, and then about a month later, they had lost the list or something. So, so they asked us to put down three names. And so I I had a complete change of, of heart in the sense of I had put down these names that I had certain reasons. And I'm really glad they lost the list because, first of all, they now they make no sense to me. Um, but the another friend of mine had been a Sister Mary Eucharist, and she had left the convent because of health. And she was never allowed to finish her novitiate year. So when she left, I, I mean, it kind of left this name open because I didn't want us to have names that were going to be repeats. You know, even uh, the, the word, the name Sister Teresa of the Child Jesus was the most coveted name. There was already a Sister Teresa. There was a Sister Teresita, a Sister Therese, a Sister, you know, they, they had all these variations. I just thought, you know, no one is going to take Eucharist Eucharista. And I had grown so much in my love of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And I thought, well, you know, I, chances are I'm not going to get it, but I'm going to put it down for my first choice. So I put it down. And the whole idea of taking a new name is to show a new way of life. And this is like, not that our baptismal names weren't fantastic. And many religious do go back to their baptismal names. And they did that post Vatican II, many of them. So um, I, I really cherished my old name, which was Donna, but I really loved Donna Marie. So I was named after the Blessed Mother. And uh, I thought, why not Sister Mary Eucharista? Because I love, we all were going to get Mary in some derivative, some form of Mary, because that was what the community uh, had. It was kind of a, an unwritten rule, but it was something everybody had. And I just thought, I love you, Jesus. I, I would, I would not mind one bit being named after you. So uh, another sister in my group was Sister Paracleta Marie, and it was like, wow, wow, that's the Holy Spirit. I was thinking, boy, that wouldn't have been bad either. But Eucharista really stood out. I put it down. They chose it. I did not find out until at the altar. I was. It was announced. 
Donna Mazurik will now be known as Sister Mary Eucharista of Our Lady of the Cynical. And I was like, boom, this is so wonderful. Wahoo. Funny story. I think I might have said this before, but my mom came up to me in the reception line afterward and said, well, okay, honey, you got to help me with this one. Who is St. Carista? And I said, mom, <laughs> Sister Mary Eucharista. She goes, oh, the blessed sacrament, of course. Oh, for heaven's sakes. And she said, I don't know why I didn't hear that right. So anyway, it was. I'm not, I did not hear that story. I love it. <laughs> but for you to say, a sister, that you didn't actually know that that was going to be your name until the actual ritual of profession. No, none of our sisters does. Wow. I did not know that. Is that a, is that a typical custom? Some nuns in some communities don't even take different names. So uh, I, in those communities, no, but, uh, and some priests, some religious, uh, I, I mean, obviously diocesan priests don't take a, a religious name, but mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the millennials and uh, Gen Zs really like the idea of taking a name of a real, of a saint, uh, mm -hmm. just to kind of uh, carry them through. And some communities are very strong about having uh, a, a name you know, live, you know, that this be the new life that you're living. This is a, it's like a passageway into the new life. And it certainly was for me because in that same name change also came a change of, you know, I got my habit. I got my novitiate, which meant a year of cloistered life that you would not have contact with the outside, which wow. is, it's very intense. And um, in some communities, now our community, we do keep two years of cloistered living. And that's um, one of them is a, uh, it's the prayer year. It's the year of form of deep intentional formation. And the second one is more uh, it's, 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 you know, kind of geared around the apostolate, but still the novitiate. So it's something that they're very intent on making sure just like the, uh, the, the uh, propedeutic year for the young men who are going into the diocesan priesthood, we're finding more and more that it takes longer sometimes for religious women to be ready. You know, our, our social media, it's very hard for them to drop their phones and come in and, you know, to, to drop their phones before they, they leave the world and come in. It's like they've lost a limb. Uh, of their bodies, you know, sometimes uh, they say. So as I talk with sisters of other communities, they say the same thing. It's really hard. So in dropping those um, old methods of life that we have uh, had, which, you know, when I look back 41 years ago, when I entered, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have internet. All of those areas of our lives were kind of clear and free. And we thought they were, you know, I mean, I was pretty worldly. I had, uh, my mom used to say, honey, you are so worldly. How many purses do you have? How many sets of shoes? Look at all your outfits. You are, you know, your accessories uh, max out your prayer life. I, I just don't know how you're keeping God in, in the picture. And I'm like, hey, mom, I'm not a nun yet <laughs> I'm enjoy this stuff. so but you know you put off the old life put on the new life and that new life included a new name and that was uh and and i remember hearing there's a part in revelation where these uh virgins will follow the lamb wherever he goes and speak a language no other can speak and um i've mentioned that before and protestant or, or non-catholics have said well, that's all of us. All of us are going to follow the lamb and speak a language no other will speak. And I, I'm sure God knows what it means. And I, 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 I mean, I, I used to be kind of like, ha ha, I get to speak a language no other can speak. And that's going to be so great. And if it, if it's extended to everyone, that's great too. But at the time it was very influential for me. Well, isn't there a, uh, that there's a teaching of the church about a particular aureole or a particular crown that is given in heaven to martyrs and virgins. I thought at oh, least yes. those two, right? So, that, Oh, certainly. Yes. The, yeah. uh, the idea of, I mean, virginity is, uh, is a real sacrifice, intentional, mm -hmm. deliberate virginity for the sake of the kingdom, which is what Mary and Joseph had as well. And that's, uh, you know, why we follow this. Jesus said for those who can take it, let him take it. And that was one of those areas that I was like, I, I mean, I want to be married. I, I love guys. I would have 
been married uh, with the right person at the right time and had, I even had names for my kids. And then when at my senior retreat, like I've said before, I was 18 and I realized, oh no, this is, this is not good. It sounds like I have a religious vocation. And that's where I realized, yeah, I can live the vows. If God's calling me, I, I certainly do want to answer because I don't want to get to the end of my life and look back and think I could have been a nun, but I, mm -hmm. I pushed it away. It's not that God wouldn't have received me anyway. It's just that he gave me an option that I was able to pick up at that time. And I thank him every day for that because the grace of that is beyond any jewels, any crown, anything just to be able to get into heaven would have been enough for me there. Now I just want a relationship with Jesus. And that's really the whole thing, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, Sister Mary Eucharist, you're talking so powerfully about this state in life, right? That's sort of the theological way of referring to the consecrated life. And I don't know how many Catholics have preserved that understanding that a religious vocation or a vocation to being a religious sister or a religious brother or a religious priest right is is a state in life it, it's elevated to one of three states in life right the priesthood mm -hmm. uh, married life and consecrated religious life uh, and i love the the profound way you were um talking about the vows as uh, redeeming and bringing transformative power to the the, uh, the these wounds that are part of the the fall i was very mm -hmm. struck by what you shared in terms of the way in which as you get older, you're seeing more manifestations of these things. And and I think a lot of folks would be thinking, gosh, sister's been at this for over 40 years, her whole life, but then very intentionally is 40. You'd think that there'd be diminishments rather than in, in uh, highlighted enhancements, but I think you're actually sharing a profound insight that the closer we get to the Lord in holiness, the more we realize with a greater sense of clarity and even urgency, the distance that still remains. Oh, and also I, I didn't mean to say that it was like, I see that this is more enhanced in me that the, the effects, I, I think my recognition is enhanced. Mm -hmm. I can look at the things that I thought didn't matter or I excuse them on some level, like, well, we can't help that. And then to see them in the, in a special light. And I always know when it's the Holy spirit, when it happens in a, just a moment, and it's a, a moment of intense clarity. And it's like, it's a wow. It's like, wow, I hadn't thought of it that way before. And it's the Holy Spirit. And it's so amazing when that little, just that little aha happens. And it's, it's not just a right brain thing. It's actually the Holy Spirit enlightening our minds to see the thing that, yes, I studied it, I knew it intellectually, but to get it as a, at a heart knowledge is really a, a gift. It's not something we can make happen. It has to be, we have to be ready for it. And the Holy Spirit just picks the right moment. That's powerful. That's Sister Mary Eucharista joining me today on the program, whether you're watching this um, on a social media platform or whether you're listening on the radio, it's great to have you on, uh, Sister Mary Eucharista. She's a Thank Sister you. Mary, Mother of the Church. And um, Sister, you, you're sharing a lot of wisdom today that probably shows up in some of the conferences you give, some of the days of reflection you lead in your own spiritual direction. Sister is uh, the director of programs and events at Immaculate Heart Retreat Center in Spokane, Washington. And I'm the initiator. I'm the initiator. I initiate our programs. I used to be the program manager and Rick is the director and the front office works on the programs and that's Kristen. So I just do our retreats now at this point. And uh, that's where uh, my, my work is more in giving retreats, doing spiritual direction and initiating the program. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you, my friend. No, I love that. I'm used to being interrupted by the women in my life. So you just, you just <laughs> flow right on into that role. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at the, uh, the homepage, I H rc.net immaculate heart retreat center ihrc.net and i love that it's a peaceful place to pray and ponder lots of things happen here including adoration 
that happens where you can come and, and visit the Lord, the Eucharistic Lord, the second mm-hmm. Fridays of the uh, second Friday mornings of the month, starting at nine in the morning, ending at 12 noon, stopping in and spending time with the Lord, as well as other special events that will be happening. And we're going to talk a bit about these, including private retreats. So, sister, I know that I promised folks, and and when I asked you on, I wanted to ask you about growth in the spiritual life, and I had two directions I wanted to take in that. One of them is connected to doing special events like that happen at retreat centers, like Immaculate Heart Retreat Center. But I also want to ask you about books, because I'm guessing when you're doing spiritual direction, lots of times folks are coming to you, they're hungry to go deeper, and one of the tools that you use are encouraging them to access the the wisdom of our tradition and, and of various writers. And so let me ask you, do you have a, a sort of a favorite book or a set, a set of books that you typically recommend for folks who are trying to grow in their own Catholic life of faith? You know, Tom, uh, I especially notice when we are, uh, well, like when a private retreat and will come and request spiritual direction, and sometimes we'll have someone come for two weeks and I've already got a setup of all the spiritual directions, so I have to squeeze them in wherever, but typically they'll need a book or two, and I'll bring them to our library, which is upstairs. It's a, a second floor um, set of books that mostly have been given to us, but uh, you know, the classes of the spiritual life are, are really good to look back on and and have uh, you know a relationship with, if you will, in the convent, we had to read all the spiritual classics um, like uh, Garrigou Lagrange, uh, the 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 spiritual life. It was like yeah, the he, three ages of the spiritual yes, life, or something oh like that. Oh my goodness, that was such a heavy tome. Mm-hmm. And you know, you're not really ready for that when you're 20 or 21 years old. But um, I think going back and reading the the works that I read when I was younger has really helped me. Um, Looking at the intensity of those books, I think that earlier in my religious life, um, the intense books, I I always liked the the biographies of the saints. Those were uh, way easier for me to read. And also I felt a kinship with those saints. And the neat thing about saints is when you read about a story of a saint, you don't just think of them as a time in time past, you, th- you have a relationship with that person. Um, St. Anthony of Padua has always been a huge favorite of mine, but I got my devotion to him when I was at home and I had a relic of him that I safeguarded. In our family, mom always said, all right, if we ever have a fire, what are we going to go rescue? My brothers automatically said the dogs. And I said, well, Daisy, my dog, I would get mom. And she said, but you're in charge of what? And I said, the relics, mom. So I, we had five family relics that were passed down through our family. And I think they're in a religious house now. I don't remember what happened to them. But um, that is uh, something that kind of sharpens your understanding of the relationship that we have with these older brothers and sisters and the Lord. But, you know, in the convent, I read Story of a Soul. That's always like your first book. And I had read this when I was maybe 14 years old. When I was 12, I read The uh, the Way of Divine Love, which is a very heavy book. But I was reading it and I found out that the nun in that book was in love with Jesus. And at that time, I was thinking, oh, she's like talking about Jesus like a boyfriend. That's weird. And as I was reading the book, I realized it it was too old for me, but I was also interested in the intellectual information there. But I read later in a Father Lassant's book for girls, it said, don't give girls stories of religious falling in love with God until a certain age, because they're not going to understand it and they'll be turned off. And I was like, hey, that was me. And it didn't occur to me until way later that I was going to be in love with our Lord. It was it was after I had already determined God had had um, invited me to religious life, and it was only then that I realized Jesus is going to be my spouse. And I thought, oh, that's not gross at all. That's really cool. And um, so, but the story of the soul that I read when I was um, fourteen or so, I, I, I look at that book. I, I I looked at that book as a twenty-one or twenty-two year old, and as I read it. 
I really got inside the story so much better, but it wasn't until like four years ago when I was working on my certification for spiritual direction, which I had been doing for years anyway, but I did get the cert afterwards. Um, I read it again and I was so elevated in soul. I, I don't know. It's hard to explain. It was like, um, God just, I was like, Therese, I get it. Oh my goodness. You are so wonderful. And I just love you and thank you. And I'm so glad we have a relationship. She led me to read this book on a paper that I was doing. And that book really, it's got different layers that you only pick up at certain points in your life. Another really good book is A Grief Observed. Before by- you do that, I want to just say this. So for folks who are not aware, I, and I'm guessing most people are, The Story of a Soul is the autobiography of the little flower, St. Therese of Lisieux, a discalced Carmelite religious sister who lived in the late 1800s, and she died when she was 24 um, from... Um, uh, tuberculosis, not tuberculosis. Um, yes, no, it was tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, yes. Yes. And it, it's a, she wrote it under obedience uh, to her older sister, who was her mother superior. And uh, the book had an incredible impact after she died. It was her her reputation for holiness, and then it it was one of the most read books in the 20th century, which is really very striking. Um, and so I, uh, not surprising sister that yeah. as a young religious, you'd have read that book or as a young lady, even, um, uh, was one of the first books that I read as well when my faith came alive, uh, Indeed. as a, as a, in my late teen years and yes, but please, you, now you wow. talked about a grief observed. Yes, that is C.S. Lewis. And mm-hmm. I read that in college. I was able to take the faith and reason course over at Gonzaga for my philosophy master's. And in doing so, I was allowed to uh, participate in one of the most scintillating and uh, heart filling uh, experiences of my life and hearing both uh, Dr. Doug Kreese and Father Robert Spitzer join up and take us through uh, faith and reason, the two wings which carry us uh, in this, in the in our our religious, our spiritual, our lives, and that faith is uh, w- without reason is fideism, and reason without faith is rationalism. But we need reason and faith. And to uh, hear the wisdom of these two wonderful professors who also happen to be my spiritual director, Father Spitzer too. Um, I I could hear him. In in fact, his his talk at Gonzaga was just, he just did it this week. It was just amazing. Um, But uh, A Grief Observed really opened my eyes to how we can think we know who God is. And when we experience a terrible trauma in life, like the loss of someone we love, For example, as in the case of C.S. Lewis, uh, his whole understanding of God just fell apart like a pack of cards. And he has he had never felt so unable to understand what faith really was. And I think for me, I was ready. I was tuned in. It was a book that was just perfect for me at that time. And It helps me in in doing spiritual direction to understand when a person is like at a loss. It's like, uh, and also something else that should be known about spiritual direction. uh, People who are in their later years will sometimes suddenly realize, I don't have any feeling in my prayer. I don't really know if I really love God. We start asking ourselves questions like, am I really a Catholic? Do I have a relationship with God? C.S. Lewis didn't know. He was so lost at at this point that um, to direct someone through that would take an art and a skill. And it's very important to know that ahead of time, that this is not something that we would expect in the later years of our lives. But in many cases, many saints have gone through this. And St. Therese herself felt completely abandoned by God at the end. And her last words were, Jesus, I love you. And she said, I don't care. Whatever my, my, my mind is telling me, she was very ill. And she still had a smile on her face. And you couldn't really tell that she, uh, she felt abandoned by God. She was in spiritual darkness, just like St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's really, it's a, it's a very powerful event. 
Well, you know, uh, again, I'm talking with Sister Mary Eucharista, so beautifully sharing uh, insights into some of her favorite works, works that she recommends. And that's interesting because uh, if you said, I'm going to pick a book by C.S. Lewis, I don't know if I have even would have gotten down to A Grief Observed, right? There's so many books he's written that have had such big impact on people's lives. Uh, Mere Christianity, Screw Tape Letters, The Great Divorce, uh, Letters to Malcolm on Prayer, Miracles, uh, um, the, the Narnia Four series. Loves, Chronicles of Narnia, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, the Space Trilogy. Yes. Yeah. I, I've read them. I've read most of those. And out of all of them, I guess I was just in a point of my life. And plus, in between, I was I was working so hard. We had just come into full communion. I was working hard at Gonzaga on my master's. And I was also working hard at the retreat center on a new job that I I'd been a high school teacher for so many years that this was a complete switchover. Plus starting a new community. It was just like everything was so much there was there was way too much going on in my life but a grief observe stands out in a very particular way mm -hmm. i i hope people will pick it up and read it yeah it then it refers to a part of his life that most people don't really think about and that was that he ended up getting married later in life and it was it's about the death of his wife joy um and so that is a um that the book is, it is very striking. I, I didn't remember it having the same impact on me that it's had on you, but I love the fact sister that you're connecting it to an aspect or a stage in the journey of faith that many older Catholics go through. Um, I was aware of, you know, the, like the intense darkness or spiritual attacks that come upon certain saints at the end of their lives, but not as much that sense of like the desert, the darkness, the dryness, and the questioning that can happen to, let's call them seasoned citizens, like longtime Catholics who are now maybe empty nesters, maybe widows or widowers, or even just at a, at a stage in their lives where they lack maybe energy and verve and, and all of that. And that can have a, an overflow effect on their spiritual life. I really, frankly, hadn't really read or, or thought much about that. I, I'm getting closer to it, but I haven't really thought that much about it. That's a really interesting insight. And, you know, I also want to put a word in, we mentioned states of life, and there's also dedicated single life, which people have, have been in. And before reaching that decision of a person to say, I am going to live my life as a single person, um, sometimes they can get into deep depression or darkness or a time of spiritual uh, desert where they are really tested. And that's something that I think um, we need to also remember that they have a place in those states of life and that we uh, they don't have partners or people that will be uh, inviting them in for social events and that they can experience a lot of darkness as well. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we need to be. And even um, young unmarried people who are looking for a partner can't find a partner, have prayed all their lives for a partner and don't know what God has in store for them. And that kind of desert experience is also there for them. And they need a little bit of encouragement and help. You're right. That That is a mystery. And it's something that I've started to hear more. So my oldest daughter is just 23. Um, but I said just, but she's starting to look around and saying, where are all the good Catholic guys? Even though she's she's like, she's like actively discerning. She's like, if I'm supposed to be a religious sister, Lord, I, I say yes in advance. So Lord, if I'm supposed to be married, you better bring me around a good Catholic guy. And um there aren't that there aren't as many as maybe she would want. Now she's not living around where we are. Um, she's down in Portland, but I said, come back this way. I, I, <laughs> I can make some introductions because <laughs> uh, I don't believe in arranged marriages. I just believe in highly assisted marriages. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, that, I usually I usually tell them that the uh, their your your future spouse is alive right now, and every day. When you, well, and, and whenever you uh, go to mass, whenever the, the host is elevated and the chalice, say to our Lord, show me, bring me to, to, uh, to an awareness of my future spouse. I prayed for my future spouse uh, when I was at mass. And of course, uh, Raphael, the archangel, who I was also asking, because I said, my husband is alive right now. So you get me over to him. And then to find out that I was married, I was going, you know, that Jesus was my spouse. I was like, okay now just a minute that all right 
You uh, pulled a fast one on me there. He did, Raphael, but Raphael is still my very close friend, and he is really a helper in those times, like a find, like a, a spouse finder for Tobias mm-hmm. or Tobit Jr. He will find these young women and young men, a spouse that will be their life partner, who will bring them closer to God and make them very, very happy. That's hard to trust, right? That's hard for uh, for young people, especially because there's a surrender there. There's a giving over control and trying to figure stuff out. And what do I have to do to make it happen? And and that's a hard one. So let's talk a little bit about that in terms of the spiritual life. Um, again, I'm talking with Sister Mary Eucharista, and she's the initiator of very special events like days of private retreats, days of renewal, days of prayer and other events happening at Immaculate Heart Retreat Center in the South Hill of Spokane, a beautiful location. Um, I've been there a number of times. It's ihrc.net, ihrc.net. And sister, next week I'm going to have on um, Father Hightower, who's leading a uh, an event coming up on Ash Wednesday, a silent day of prayer, which is really exciting. Um, but there are other things that are going on at the retreat center as well. So why don't we talk about a little bit um, the way in which events like a retreat, a day of prayer can have um, a specific difference, can can bring about a breakthrough or uh, a, a, like a new insight into the, the spiritual journey. Yes. Well, I, I, I've had, especially recently, I've had people come and say after a day of prayer, you know what, this is just perfect. It's something that, you know, we start out in quiet, we get the gift of silence through the day. We have a choice if we want to have a talking lunch or not, but we have two conferences, Holy Mass, we have the Sacrament of Reconciliation, we have Adoration, we have the Rosary, and we have quiet time to walk on the beautiful paths in the sunshine at Immaculate Heart, or even if there's not sunshine. But there is a a time of quiet, which is a treasure where you get to turn off your technology and you get to move forward. So really, no matter what the topic, it's always going to be a gift. But uh, especially we try to find topics that people have asked for in our evaluations or things that uh, are like the bishop is trying to really encourage in the in the diocese. We are, uh, of course, when you're de- dealing with Lent, you have uh, always Ash Wednesday is going to be a day of prayer at Immaculate Heart Retreat Center. Always we will have a Holy Week retreat, which is uh, going to be held for women uh, this particular year on April 3rd through 5th and for men on April 6th through 8th. And it's something that really, really brings us into this deeper uh, sense of quiet that we can hear God speaking to us. And actually, you know, so many decisions in people's lives have been made on retreats, but even a day of prayer is so solid to give you just this uh, wonderful time of, of information from God and building that relationship, which is hopefully alive for all of us. But if we feel like it's dulling a little bit, sometimes after the holidays, people have a harder time getting back into their prayer lives. And that's why I'm, I'm always kind of happy about Lent, because it brings us into a heighter, heightened awareness of what God is calling us to in the power of the resurrection, which we have to attain through the, the, the power of the crucifixion. And so to kind of wean ourselves from some of those worldly things that are always surrounding us and to get our lives in order and have a little bit more of a um, program, if you will, of prayer and adoration. Adoration is so uh, underutilized, I believe. And it's something that really can bring us back on so many levels. And we can do this anytime in our churches. Just go to church, sit, be, let God speak to you. But especially at a day of prayer, it's all organized for you. You don't have to do any cooking. You can just be, and we take care of you. Uh, that's a that's a beautiful way of um, bringing up something that folks don't realize is the amount of time, attention, stress, and energy that even just things like, okay, what am I going to do with my time? And what about a meal? They're just little energy drains that can pull mm-hmm. us away rather than just giving yourself over to the flow of the event itself. I think that's um, beautifully well said. And I think there's a lot of wisdom there, right? It's it's something that um, you're not making up. It's something that you're just drawing on the incredible tradition of uh, of the spiritual life in in our in our life of faith, sister. You also do spiritual direction, private spiritual direction. Um, folks, uh, some folks again have probably heard of that, 
Uh, I have a question around it. So as you describe what spiritual direction is, one of the things that um, people have asked me is, you know, am I a good candidate to receive spiritual direction? Because I think sometimes folks look to this, look to having a spiritual director when what they're really um, maybe needing is just a little bit more um, discipline in um, developing a spiritual life. And so would you say that there is a, let's call it a minimum bar of commitment that you would be looking for in someone who would say, yeah, I, I have... I have enough spiritual maturity or a particular stability of uh, spiritual attitudes in place before they were uh, like identifying themselves as I, I should really be seeking spiritual direction to take the next step. Sure. The uh, one of the uh, areas of concern would be whether a person has a regular spiritual life, a prayer life. And if a person doesn't, and they're just kind of like walking in off the street, if you will, it's not really going to benefit them. And it would more or less be a waste of time uh, unless they had themselves begun to kind of look it up online, fi figure out what would need to be there, which would be a spiritual life, something like um, uh, anything from a, a daily rosary to uh, the liturgy of the hours or uh, you know, at least a morning prayer or some uh, some other kind of prayer that really anchors and 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 settles them into a relationship. The whole purpose of spiritual direction is to enhance one's relationship with God, and the Trinity is always there, always begging for us to be in relationship. And we pass the Trinity by just with our natural needs and don't even uh, think that God is aching for us. And without our knowing it, our hearts are aching for God. When we see the Lord after we die, we're going to be so attracted, like, like metal is attracted to a magnet. We're going to see God and go, oh, I have always wanted you. This is it. This is our, this is our testing ground, where in a life of faith, we are going to enhance that magnetism that that god already has for us and clear away all those other things if you ever tried to attach a, a piece of metal to a magnet when there's like five wads of kleenex or something in the way it's like trying to just get everything out of the way so that our little pitiful metal can attach itself to god's beautiful magnetism and to let god influence us so that we can draw more people to him because the good news is too great to keep to ourselves. And so this is where if we are really trying in our spiritual lives and we have found that, wow, I've got a real problem here. I have found that my work is really starting to get in the way of my spiritual life, or I, I've always been so okay with my prayers and now something's going on and I don't know what it is or maybe there's a special thing that I'm doing to uh you know help in the parish and I'm starting to realize um I am experiencing some difficulties with not only my relationships but I'm realizing that being involved in church isn't the paradise mm -hmm. that I thought it was mm -hmm. and maybe you know sometimes people just need to meet a couple times with the spiritual director and uh, to find out what those things are. A good spiritual director will be able to ask questions that will bring about like, oh, you're in a marriage that isn't blessed by the church. Well, this might be one of those areas that we'll need to look at here. And because genuinely, some people really don't know. Mm -hmm. I just ran into someone whose parents did not know. And the, the convert father had find, meanwhile come into the church and then there was there had never been a catholic marriage and so you know sometimes it's things like this that can really get missed and it's not it's no one's in particular fault it's just that good we caught it let's move forward and so you know it's all about the resurrection and if anything's impeding uh our lives to not bring about that resurrection here so that we can draw others to the good news we need to clear those things up Amen. Well, Sister Mary Eucharista, today with me on the program, whether you're watching or listening, 
uh, sister, you've cleared up a lot of things. Um, and it makes me, it makes clear to me that I want to have you back on again to continue oh, this conversation. You. I feel like we just got started and we're already at the end of our program. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, this is, it's richness is what it is. It's sort of full to overflowing and you've done that today on the program. So thank you so much for taking time to be with me today to learn more about Sister Mary Eucharista, access her spiritual direction, the days of prayer that she leads or the other wonderful retreats happening at Immaculate Heart Retreat Center. Please go to ihrc.net, ihrc. Dot net. Click on events. You'll see a number of wonderful things coming up. And there'll be other interviews to come later this month, including with Father Hightower next week. Thanks, Thank sister. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. God bless you.